we have we have a large text before us this morning, so I'm going to try to read it. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> I want I, I would like you to listen to the text, and then and then we'll then we're going to get into it and roll our sleeves up and get busy. Um, it's cold outside. You stay in here and be warm. Don't have to be in a hurry. I'll try to get this in under an hour. <laughs> But it, it is. You know, there's nothing worse than being lost. You ever been lost? <laughs> I've been out hunting before in the swamp, <laughs> going the wrong direction. I don't know how many times, <laughs> thinking I'm never going to get out of this place. Probably the only other thing about being worse than being lost is knowing there's no one looking for you. Today's story is about God who came looking for a woman. God came looking for you, wherever you find yourself. In uh, Luke 19.10 it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If you did anything else out of this story today, know this. God comes looking for you. And God came looking for you and will continue to come looking for you. He come looking for a woman with five divorces. Five husbands. We fight over in the church who's right and who's wrong and who's got one wife, two wives. She had five and the man you're with now isn't your wife, isn't your husband. <laughs> he didn't come to judge her or condemn her according to John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. He come to give her living water and to offer her life. And no matter what her past was, how bad you think it might be. And trust me, he picked the woman for a reason. Because it looked tainted. It looked like somebody you wouldn't speak to. It looked like somebody you would cross the street and get on the other side. Because she just wasn't good enough. And Jesus said, I must go. I've got a divine meeting with a woman at a well. And it really had nothing to do with her past. And everything to do with him. So let's read the text and then let's, let's uh, get into it. Um, Ken's going to try to flip some when I get going here because I told him I'm going to try to read from my Bible. He'll, he'll move along for me. It says, the Pharisee heard that Jesus was uh, gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who, was bat who did the baptizing, but his disciples. And when the, Lord, when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Kind of interesting, remember last week, John they kept saying, John, Jesus is baptizing more than you are. And, and, and John says, you know, you can only receive what's given to you from above. He must increase, that I must, I must decrease, that he can increase. It's an interesting thing here that the Savior says, well, let me just get out of this. Uh, let's go back to Galilee and leave this alone. He didn't want the Pharisees to cause any problems. But, you know, Jesus was concerned and John was very gracious in the sense that he knew, no, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm just, I'm just here giving a message. But yet we see that Jesus took time and just said, well, let's, let's go up. Let's go back to Galilee. And then he said in verse 4, now he, had, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called uh, Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, uh, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water from Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had, had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you t ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the, the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and, and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will thirst again or be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. And have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Kind of interesting. She changed the story. <laughs> give me this living water. He said, well, before I give you the water, go call your husband. <laughs> What's that got to do with the story? But it's interesting. We'll get into it. He says, I have no husband. She replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you, you have no husband. Uh, the, uh, the fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you... and." 
and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can tell that you are a prophet. Our father worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews uh, claim that the place where we m must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in J Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. The salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Just about this. Here we go. God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know uh, that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And when Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned. Uh, were surprised to find him talking with a woman. No, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the woman, to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Okay, so I know that's a long reading, but I want you to get some of this. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> he went to my next life. <laughs> Jesus must go. You read that text. If you look at it in the Greek, the word is day. It, 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 it sounds like day. D-A-Y is how you pronounce it. D-E-I, but it sounds like day. So the word day is must, necessary, inevitable. The son of God, it was inevitable that he had to go to Samaria. Now, you have to know that Jews do not like Samaritans. Samaritans are half-breeds. They're mixed. When Assyria, about 722, took over Samaria, they planted their own people. A lot of the Jews intermarried. And, and, and the Jews of Jerusalem thought they were half-breeds. They called them dogs, wanted nothing to do with them. As far as a female, they would consider, they even wrote their own laws and said that she was in a perpetual men menstrual cycle, meaning that she was always dirty. Everywhere she sat, anything she touched, anywhere she went, she was a second-class citizen. Not alone was she a woman, and in that day and era, that just knocked her down. So I'm just here to tell you, this story is about a woman who in her day was an outcast, was broken, felt like she didn't fit anywhere. Nobody wanted anything to do with her. And in fact, in our story, she goes out to meet Jesus at noon. And we know if you study it, that most of the women went in the morning because it's cool. Who wants to go out in the heat of the day and draw water? She went at noon because there was nobody else there to ask her questions about her background, probably. I'm, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened. We don't know why she's divorced or remarried five times. Maybe they all died. I don't know. I want you to know this, though, if you're thinking that. She's a female, and she, she could not divorce a male. She had no right. All a Jewish man had to do in her day was show up in, in the court, in the city court, and five times repeat, I'm giving you away, I'm giving you away, you're not, we're divorced, and she would be done. She had no control. And probably the man she's with now is because she's looking for a place to live. She had no means to take care of herself. And every man that had been a part of her life cast her out for one reason or another. You could marry a woman back in that day. And if, if she disrobed and she had any kind of informity, you could, you could divorce her. She burnt your toast, you could divorce her. You found a prettier woman, you could divorce her. This woman is sitting at a well. And she looks up and she sees a Jewish man. Now you, she, she's like, why are you here? Do you know that this, 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 this can't be? You are breaking every rule that we have. He's a rabbi. A rabbi cannot even come in contact with anything unclean like that. Let alone is he a Jewish man. She, he's a rabbi. He can't get within her vicinity. And then he says, let me have a drink from your cup. <laughs> he would be unclean. Let alone is he a male who would not speak to a Samaritan woman at all. Let alone another woman probably in public. That just didn't go on in their day. And so um, I just, I, I want you to get this because Jesus said, I got to go. Jesus goes places where you and me won't go. He crosses streets that you won't cross and I won't cross. He knocks on doors that you won't knock on. In fact, some of you are sitting here right now and you have somebody in your family you won't talk to. Because they're just not worthy of the gospel. 
or they hurt you or they made you upset. You have people in church you won't have anything to do with. Next building down the road, two buildings over, three blocks over, you won't have anything to do with them because of something you have in your mind about how bad they are. Yet Jesus says, I must go. This woman needs me. I've got a divine appointment. He's the son of God. Did he really have to go? I doubt he had nothing he had to do. He created everything. He says, I'm going to go. Because I've got a message to share with her. And it wasn't just her. The message he shares is going to bring a whole village, whole village of people. He's going to use her. And I would challenge you to say that you might not know how God might use some of the people in your life. And you could be mad and angry and upset. But you got a message. One of the main points of this story of the woman at the well is that Jesus breaks all barriers. Most people would go around Samaria. It's about 100, I see, now it's about 70 miles from Judea where Jesus has got to go up to Galilee. He's walked about 40 miles this day. They say from, from Judea down there up to Galilee would be about a five day journey. Just to tell you how much these Jews did not like Samaria, they would usually go around the Jordan River all the way up past Galilee and then have to come back down. They'd make it 140 miles. They doubled their trip not to get dirty by being in the presence of a Samaritan. And Jesus marches right through the middle of the city. 1969, Fred Rogers on, on my neighborhood. I don't know if you know this, 1969, some of you put some of you weren't born yet. Mr. Rogers, during a time when blacks could not swim with whites in public pools, asked this black cop to come onto his show. And he's sitting there with his feet in a pool of water. And he says he's resting his feet because his feet are tired. And he says, would you join me, Mr. officer? And I wish I can't remember his name right now. You join me? He says, I have no towel. He says, I'll share my towel with you. Same year Supreme Court voted that blacks could swim with whites. Jesus tears down barriers. He went to Samaria to see a woman who had five husbands. And the man she's living with now is not her husband. Jesus came to my house. He came to your house. And whether you want to believe it or not, you had things in your past that you didn't want exposed. You had things you hid. You hoped nobody knew about. But oh, Jesus could tell you everything about you. Just like he told that woman everything about her. Jesus breaks all barriers. He breaks a racial barrier. We know that in the story. We ought to break racial barriers. He breaks all gender barriers. You know, he gives this woman respect that she had not seen in her day and age. And if you're a woman here today and you think you're a second-class citizen, you are no second-class citizen to Jesus. And you should feel like no second-class citizen in this church. You are as important as any male ever wanted to be. You have as much love in you from God as any man ever had in him. You were created in God's image just like any man was ever created. And you should never have to feel like your past has stopped you from being what God wants you to be. I don't care where you came from. I don't care how rich you are. Well, that was my next one, social barriers. He, it doesn't matter how, much, how famous you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, your color of your skin or your gender. God sent his son into the world to save the world because he loved the world. He loved you. That nobody should perish, but all should come to know him. His story is a powerful story about a God that loves his people powerfully. And will go across barriers that nobody else would break in order to bring you the gospel. He breaks all sin barriers. He can save murderers, thieves, prostitutes, male and female, broken marriages, you name it, hatred, anger, bitterness. There's not a thing that Jesus, if you come to know Jesus, there's not a sin in your life that he can't forgive. 
you've got to be honest like this woman was when she looked at Jesus and said, I have five husbands. He said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got five husbands. And the guy you're with now is not your husband. That wasn't really the deal. He wanted her to be honest. He wanted her to check herself. Because you remember in the story, he's going to say, and we'll get there in a minute without getting ahead of myself. But he'll, he'll say, if you ask me, I'll give you living water. She said, oh, give me that water. Let me have that living water, Jesus. But before he gives it to her, he says, but we've got to make an exchange. I've got to know you know where you are. And she says, yeah, I, I know my past. Yeah. Go, go get your husband. You see, God wants to give you living water, but he's still going to require some that you examine yourself. We'll, we'll get there. John shows the humanness of Jesus. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired, it says. I want you to know that God came into the world and put on flesh. After walking 40-some miles, he was tired, and he sat down by the well in the heat of the day. He sent his, he sent his disciples off to get some chicken nuggets. <laughs> they went in town to get, get them a hamburger and some fish, fish fries, whatever they were. <laughs> and he sits down by the well. He shows the humanness of Jesus. This is why I think why in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 it says that Jesus understands every weakness of ours. Because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of the merciful God. That there we will be treated with undeserved grace. And we will find help just like this woman was at the well. Jesus was human. And he knows what it is to be tired. And he knows what it is to fight the struggles in this world. And therefore you can come to him boldly knowing just like he did this woman at the well. That he will forgive your sins. If you're honest to approach him. If you ask. Bring all your burdens unto me. He said ye that are heavy laden. I will give you rest. God offers you and me a gift in exchange for believing in his only begotten son. You see that word gift? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked for you a drink, you would have asked me and we would have given you and I would have given you and he would have given you living water. You see, it's an exchange. I want to give you living water, Jesus says. Just like he said it to her, I will give you living water. It is a gift from God. If you would just take it, you just know where you're coming from. It's funny, again, in that story, Jesus, he understood, he understands you. He says, I have no husband, she replied. We went to this, you're right, he said, you have, you, you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not yours. What you have just said is quite true. You see, that's where God is with you. He'll give you living water if you'll be truthful. He knows what's going on in your life, but see, you think, see, this is a big deal. The reason she's hurt and the reason she's beat up is because of what life has done to her. She's looking in all the wrong places. She thinks that she's finding happiness in the flesh. She thinks that in her relationship she's going to get life. And Jesus says, if you'll look at that and understand that and get rid of that, I'll give you living water where you won't thirst again. But you can continue to run after everything you want to run after in this life. But if it isn't filled with Jesus, you'll be empty. You'll be thirsty. You'll keep chasing it, keep drinking all the wrong stuff. He looks at her and she examines himself and says, I want to exchange this with you. I want to take away that brokenness. And I want to give you a gift of life. John 1, the chapter 1 says that light came into the world and the world did not know him. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Every man that cometh unto me comes unto the Father. You can have life. If you'll exchange it with God. This is what he's telling the woman. I know, I know your problems. I know where you think you're finding your happiness. I know what kind of life you've been living. We can get past that. You, you carry baggage in your life. Whether it's you didn't think you fit in. Whether you didn't think you're popular enough. Whether you don't think you're... Pretty enough, whether you, whether you thought you didn't come from the right family, or maybe you're from the other side of the railroad tracks. And Jesus says, that's, that's fine. I'll give you life. You give me your life, I'll give you my life. We'll make the exchange. I'll give you the free gift of grace. 
That's one of the things, though, in the church that we don't preach a lot is repentance. And that's what he's telling the woman. You're right. The man you're with now is not your husband. Go back and get your husband. Make the change. Repent. And you can get life. That's what he's telling her. If you reject Jesus, you will always be searching. Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Like I said, you can chase after anything in this world you want to chase after. It won't satisfy you. You'll just keep going back to the well. Going back to the bottle. Going back to pornography. Going back to hatred. Going back to anger and bitterness. And going back to everything that you're living in today. In order to satisfy whatever that urges you have in your life. Because it's empty because you don't have Jesus. He said, if you don't drink of me, you'll stay hungry, thirsty. You'll never be satisfied. This world will never be what you want it to be. One day that life will come crumbling down. And great will it be its fall. Jesus isn't focused on her shame. He knows uh, there is no grace without repentance. That's, that's, that's where I think he's doing. You think Jesus showed up and said, ha, <laughs> I just want to embarrass you. I'm just going to drag out your dirty laundry. Is that why he's at the well? He just wants to rake her over the coals and say, well, you know, look at your past. No, that's not the God he is. He wants to give her a gift. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son that whoever uh, has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He sent his son to save her. He, Jesus showed up that day to offer her forgiveness, to offer her grace. He didn't get there to go over her dirty past. He knew about her dirty past. He does the same thing in your life and he does the same thing in my life. I'm thankful that he doesn't drag out my dirty laundry. I'm thankful that he crossed wherever he tracks he had to cross to get to me and to change me. We must worship God in spirit and in truth because God is spirit. So we, we could get into that. We, we'll talk a little bit about it. I want you to know that I think truth is the word of God. Jesus is the truth. He's the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. There's nothing created that he did not create. John 1.14 says, And the word came into the world and put on flesh and dwelt among you. That being Jesus Christ. The spirit is, is God's spirit, I believe. I believe you are, the spirit is placed in you, but you have your spirit that, that joins with God's spirit. But, but what I want you to get out of this is where I believe this text is, if you keep it in context, is about sincerity. When he looked at the woman and she's going to say to him, well, they worship on that mountain and we worship on this mountain. And, and Jesus says, there's a day coming where you won't worship on any one of those mountains. You're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. And, and he said, God is a spirit and he's looking for those kinds of worshipers, right? That's the text. What he's teaching here is sincerity. You remember Matthew says, these people arm me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God is looking for worshipers that come today to him with an honest heart. He's looking for those that are coming, not because of rules and regulations, but because they want him and a, and a lifetime with him, a relationship with him. But it's not just lip service. You're not just showing up and, and reciting the, 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 the do's and the don'ts of the Bible. Or you're not just citing why you do what you do. Two songs and a prayer. He says, I'm looking for those people who honor me with their hearts. There's a difference. There's a big difference between showing up and giving God lip service. We can read all about that in the Old Testament. And he said, you keep those offerings. I don't even want them. Lock the doors. Don't even come back. There's a big difference. Matthew 5, 24. Leave your gift at the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. You see, when you come to worship God, worship is about you having your life right with God, getting, getting your heart right. Not that you're perfect, but in a sense, see, if you offend your brother and you got that problem, you come here and say, God, I'm, I'm going to worship you, but you don't take care of your problems. He says, that's not worship. Worship is when you do what I ask you to do. Worship is when you're obedient. 
Again, I'm not trying to make you a perfect people, but I want you to understand in sincerity, if you love God and you want to do what you want to serve God, you want to worship God, then these things matter to you. Your heart has to be engaged. You, you must care about your neighbor. You must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy strength, and thy might, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. Those are all part of honest, sincerity, worship to God. It's about coming about listening to a preacher. It's about God in your life and who you're worshiping and serving and, and, and who you're surrendering to. And he says in 1 Corinthians, in the following directions, I have no praise for you. Your, your meetings do more harm than good. He's talking to the Corinthian church and they're taking the Lord's Supper. Some of you are getting drunk. Some of you are eating. Some don't have anything else to do. That's not acceptable worship. Acceptable worship is when you come together as a family of God and you love each other. You ever read Acts chapter 2? Where they sold everything they had in order that one could have something because somebody else didn't? That's honest worship. He says, oh man, there's a day coming where that won't matter where you worship. What will matter is who you worship and how you worship. And, not, and see, when I say how, you all think three songs, two prayers, and a preacher. Jesus says, no, it's heart. I want both of them. I want the truth that comes from the word of God and I want your heart. I want you to be committed to who I am and what I am. I want you to come and worship. Because God sent his son in the world. And he crossed the tracks to come get you. And whether you know it or not, everybody in this world has a sin problem. And everyone is lost. No one is saved. No, not one. None is righteous. And so he looks at this woman and he says, this, your condition is no different than anybody else's condition in this world. Oh, you've been married five times and you've had a bad past and you've got a lot of problems going on. So do a lot of other people. So he says, I'm the one speaking to you. I am he. And I thought, how about you? Are you listening to God? He looks at her and she says, I know about this Messiah, this Christ. Are you him? She said, he said, oh yeah, I'm him. I am the I am. I am the bread of life. I am, the, I, am, I am the door to the sheep. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the first and the last. All throughout the Bible, he says, I am, I am, I am. He looks at this woman, he says, I am. I am the one that was from the very beginning before ever. I am that one. <laughs> and the woman at the well becomes the first evangelist. Boy, that'd be a problem today, wouldn't it? <laughs> he says, you go back and tell. She didn't have to tell her. She left her water pot. She ran back to town. She says, you got to come see this guy that told me everything about my past. And it says the whole city came out to her. Woo! Jesus must not have understood that woman can't do that. He must have got it all wrong. <laughs> he took that woman. He changed her life. And she had a story to tell. You know, that's what's good about this. She had a story to tell. You got a story to tell. I got a story to tell. About how God changed my life. And in telling that story, I can affect other people. She runs, runs back to a village and says, you got to come see this guy. That told me everything about my past. That's your story. You ought to be able to tell your people, your friends. How God changed your life. You got a story to tell. You might not have been married five times. Maybe it's only once. Maybe it's twice. Maybe you were shacked up. Maybe you were a drug addict. Maybe you were a lot of things. Maybe you grew up in a bad home. A good home. But you got a story to tell. This book, this, this lesson is about stories. She runs to a city and she says, man, you got to come meet this guy that knew everything about me. I want to share that story with you. And that story changed their lives. And they came out and met Jesus. Do you tell your story? You tell what God did for you? Or you keep it a secret because, you know, they might not want to hear it. That lady left her water pot the very reason she went to the well. And went back to the city to tell people about a guy that knew everything about her that changed her life. That God is the God you serve. 
Here's the conclusion. You're not to insert yourself in the story as, as, as Jesus. You see, a lot of people, I think, walk away from the story and say, well, I ought to treat everybody fairly, right? I ought to break down all racial barriers. I ought to, I ought to go across the track. That's not the story. That's Jesus' job. The story you hear, you're the Samaritan woman. Male or female sitting in here. It's your sins that crucified Jesus. It's your sins that put him on the cross. It's your sins that got him nailed and put in the grave and resurrected. No one is righteous. No, not one. Not you, not her, not anybody. And your sins might not be married five times, but they're just as bad as hers. And Jesus sent his son in the world to save you just like he sent him to save her. And he broke every barrier to do it. He crossed streets. He went to a well in the middle of the heat of the day. He was a man talking to a woman. He was a rabbi. And he got dirty doing the message. He was unclean. Because he come in the presence of a female Samaritan woman. You're the Samaritan in the story. You're not Jesus. He wants to know about your past. And what have you done with your sins? And what have you done with the gift that God has offered you? Have you accepted it? He offers you eternal life, water that never makes you thirsty again, water that will well up in you like springs. You live like that? You're happy to receive that? And then you tell the story because it's changed your life? I don't like to end on dumb, dumb messages. I'm more about want you to get the fact that God loves you so much, he'll meet you at the well. And some of us, I know he has. And some of us, I think, are still questioning, can he change my life? Where are you, God? Why do I still struggle with this? Why do I still have these bouts in my life that make me think that I'm not good enough? Why don't I measure up? I'm not at where I thought I would be in life. How come, how come I just don't, you know, I should be in a mansion by now. <laughs> I should be preaching at a 400-member congregation. <laughs> That chance. <laughs> Not that good. I don't have to be. I got a savior that does that for me. I'm happy with that. So if you're here this morning, Robin, this is the invitation because you asked me this out there. <laughs> it's a time for you to come and share what's ever on your mind. It's not just it's not just for any one purpose. You know, in the church we can get too caught up in it. We're gonna sing. You got something you want to share because God has spoken to you through this message or something that's been on your heart all week. I hope you'll come share it. You have a story. It's okay. People need to hear your story. Because your story might change their life. So if you're here this morning and you want to know more about Jesus, I hope you'll come as we